So, David Clark, OBE, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to take our our listeners on a, on a little journey, a little selfish journey that I'm going to take them on, kind of with our involvement in all of this. We recorded an incredible episode of our podcast with you in, in February 2022, um, and I can say it was it's been one of our most popular um, in terms of feedback that we've got. So many people reaching out to us and talking about you and your story, uh, your humour, every aspect of it was wonderful. It was a real it was a real joy for us to record, a real joy for people to listen to. Um, and then one thing that we did, we, we do loads of research when we, when we do our podcasts, um, and it's not just limited to Wikipedia, but this was one thing that came up on Wikipedia, is we looked at your Wikipedia page at the time when you were coming on, and I was looking somewhere, well, where's the bit about honours? Where's the MBE, the OBE, whatever else? And we couldn't find anything anywhere. Um, so we kind of carried on that research, tried to work it out. I then sent, and this is stuff actually I don't think you know all of this, David. Um, I then sent an email to your wonderful PA at the RNIB, Emma Evans. And I said to Emma, I've looked on Wikipedia, I've Googled everywhere, I can't find any reference to David being given an honour. Now, bear in mind, you scored more goals for England than anyone has ever scored before. It blew our mind when Emma came back to us and she said, I know it's outrageous, isn't it? He hasn't got an honour. Yeah. Um so between Emma and I, we did a little bit of, I did a bit of research um, and we worked out what the honour system was and it may or may not be in a, our application. We made an application on your behalf in March 2022. Uh, we got a, uh, a lovely letter from Matt Stringer, who was then your boss at RNIB. Um, and we got a lovely letter from Darren Harris, who was one of your teammates back in blind football. Both of them telling uh, the, the boards committee or the awards committee what a wonderful man you are and why you should get one <laughs> and my massive frustration was that was March 2022 yeah. um and we we got an acknowledgement back but we didn't really hear much else but what we were told is that this can take a long time yeah. and, it, and by god it did because um there's a few things I wanted to say about the the little temptations that we got that we thought it was going to happen um and one was you called me um just after Christmas last year and didn't get hold of me. I was um, with the kids or something. You left me a voicemail and that voicemail said, hi, Matt, I've got some, something really exciting, but confidential to tell you. And I just turned to my wife straight away and said, he's got it. He's got it. Absolutely fantastic. He's got it. Um, and then I got through to you and I, I don't know whether you noticed that I almost sounded disappointed. The news that you gave me was incredibly exciting and confidential but it wasn't the news that I was expecting which was the news that you were going to be and you're wearing a Paralympic tracksuit right now the I think you're only the second blind CEO in the country and you are now the chief executive officer of Paralympics GB which is absolutely mind-blowing but I just want to apologize if I sounded underwhelmed there was a reason <laughs> for it but tell us about Paralympics GB first because it is such an incredible thing yeah, I'm really excited to be the chief exec of the, the British Paralympic Association or Paralympics GB, as it's more commonly known. Um, I've been involved in Paralympic sports since 1987 when I first stepped onto a goal ball court, um, went to Atlanta in 96 with goal ball to the Atlanta Paralympics, changed over to football, which I started playing in 1995 and obviously then went to Beijing and London. Um, and then I guess I didn't want to fall, I didn't want to fall out of the movement. It's a fantastic movement. It stands for so much that I believe in. So I became uh, a member of the Athlete Commission and ended up chairing the Athlete Commission for the British Paralympic Association. Um, and then was voted onto the board in 2017. Um, became vice chair in 2021. Um, and um, and then this role came up and I was thought, you know what, this would be my dream role. It'd be my absolutely perfect role. And so um, I actually uh, applied for it and was very, very fortunate enough to get it. And I have to say, you know, today I'm off to a basketball tournament, a wheelchair basketball tournament in East London. Um, the, the week will pan out, you know, talking to various sports, uh, visiting, a, visiting a school to talk about Paralympic sport, um, meetings with our corporate sponsors, um and planning for paris and it's just all incredibly incredibly exciting um and as regards the uh the honor i think um firstly massively appreciate um 
you were doing what you did. I didn't know about it, uh, of course, but um, really appreciate you doing what you did. Um, I think um, I think other representations might also have been made um, over the years, which is, uh, you know, deeply gratifying. But I think the big thing for me, um, and I think most people who receive an honour would say this, that, you know, it makes you think of all the people that made a massive contribution to where you are today. And over the weekend, I've had so many different messages from different people who played that role from, you know, from my mum and dad and my family and my wife and my kids, right through to coaches, volunteers, administrators, um, friends, family, colleagues, just everybody who over the years has done something with me, whether that be, you know, just, just having fun in life or riding bikes or, um, or going to gym or being on the athletics track or playing football or playing goalball. It's just a, you know, so it's just a moment of reflection really where you can kind of go, wow, yeah, it's great. But, you know, someone told me that at the OBE, the slang for OBE is other buggers efforts, which um, <laughs> made, me, made me laugh quite a lot. Um, and uh, you know what, in a way it's right, you know, um, in that, you know, there's so, so many people that have helped me get to where I've got to and uh, uh, to find myself in what I would consider to be a dream job. Um, and, you know, one that I'm absolutely loving and looking forward to the summer of sport that we've got coming up and across the various Paralympic sports, including the European Paralympic Games in Rotterdam and the IBSA, uh, the International Blind Sports Association Games in Birmingham, um, and then onward planning to Paris. Well, I, I can only talk for myself and my motivations in, in working with you. And I, I wanted to mention a little bit about some of the work that we did together as well. But it's just wanted to be part of that journey. I, I, I think I just want the reflective glory of being associated with you, Dave. And, and, I, and I, <laughs> but it's also fun as well. And I think that's that's why there's been so many people that have been prepared to be some of those other buggers who have helped you out because you mm. kind of bring people along with huge positivity. And I think... Um, uh, you said on our podcast, I think you called yourself a, um, a big head or something like that when you talked about who would you want to take a penalty and you said me. Um, but actually, I, I do find you one of the most humble people that I know because it's kind of it's it's kind of shrouded in that sort of humour that you have, that's kind of slightly yeah. subversive humour that you have as well. So I know that you don't give yourself enough credit for what you've achieved, which has been absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. And I think I think that penalty thing, by the way, is about me taking responsibility for what happens you know it's not that I necessarily think I'm the best penalty taker in the world but I think if there's a penalty to be taken I want to step up and take that responsibility to do it and I also quite enjoyed taking penalties as well. Well I think you are someone that actually quite enjoys a, a stage which kind of brings us uh, nicely to I just wanted to to reference because there's a nice little a moment in it but um one thing we were really proud about is um after the podcast um you and I spoke about uh, one of your things is you're so keen to get the message out there you know about mm. the, ch the challenges that come with being blind but how they're easily overcome and and and, and, and the, there are so many analogies in everybody's life it doesn't matter what your challenge is whether it be blindness mm. or anything else uh, and we were really keen to get you in to see some of our clients and see some of the football clubs that we work with. And we're really proud to take you in um, to Chelsea, not least because you're a huge Liverpool fan and there's all sorts of scars that were open when we took you down to Cobham. Um, oh, yeah. But one Mostly thing that, for them, obviously. Well, quite. And I, did, I didn't want to mention, because I adore Stephen Gerrard and done lots of work with Stephen, but his slip, and, and I think you even mentioned that that day, just to get it out there in the open um, in, yeah. the, in the game against Chelsea. Um but there was a really lovely moment. The Chelsea boys that were, I think that we did 13s, 14s, 15s and 16s. Yeah. And, and they, they were fantastic in kind of interacting with you, learning from you. And then we went out and took some penalties with them. But the one thing that really stuck with me, and bearing in mind this was before you knew that you were getting a, an award, um, an honour. One of the lads asked a qu uh, question. You were handing around your England cap and you said, does anyone know what this cap is? And one of the boys said, is it an MBE? And your response to him was, not yet. There's a real <laughs> irony there, because my understanding is an OB is one step up from an MB. So the MB never came, but the OB8 uh, came in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just me, in it? Just having a bit of a, <laughs> having a, bit of a giggle. Um, I mean, look, I think I played team sports for a reason. I did, I did athletics when I was younger and uh, very individual, very on your own almost sort of competing against mates and I didn't really enjoy that and I played goalball and football because it was a 
it, it, it was a team sport. And, um, you know, and whilst I scored the goals and probably got quite a lot of the headlines for doing so, you know, I was always cognizant of the fact that whatever result we had mattered from the whole team, goalkeeper, right through the team. And um, I guess you just got to keep yourself level-headed on that on, on that basis. And, though, and so for me, as I say, look, you know, I, I, I am over the moon and overwhelmed by um, the fact that I've been awarded the OBE. There's no question about that. And, and but as I say to you, um, I think it's a recognition of um, of sort of where Paralympic sports come to. And I was really, really chuffed that the, the award was given for contrib uh, contribution to Paralympic sport um, because... For me, that's um, it's not just a sport; it's a movement, um, and I think we, the fifteen, talked about that at the last at the last Paralympics about you know disabled people standing up for themselves and being recognised and and having equity in life and and so that's really really important to me. Um, and I guess you know I've been through a bit of a life cycle with sport. You know, from as I've said to many a person, you know, it start, started off with sympathy. Oh, isn't it lovely they can do sport? Then uh, maybe empathy about, you know, well, oh, isn't it lovely they can do sport? Well, how can they do more of it? Who's going to pay for it? And then kind of the acceptance that it was mainstream and that um, it was possible to play grassroots or elite sport as a, as a, as a disabled person. And then 2012, people started to enjoy it. And, um, you know, started to feel, wow, this is really good to go to. Um, and then finally, we've arrived at sort of consuming, which is now, you know, tickets are going to start selling in October um, for the Paralympics in Paris. And I've no doubt they're going to, you know, fly out the door because people want to enjoy enjoy, and enjoy the moment, enjoy this moment of elite sport. And I think the problem the problem is, and sort of the, sort of the next chapter of challenge, if you like, is that that same situations not hasn't happened off the field of play largely so whether it's transport built environment education employment health outcomes socializing financial independence wherever you look there's a there's a negative differential so i guess for me the wonderful thing about um this whole thing is that first of all it recognizes what's gone on within the paralympic movement and so many people contribute to that as i say but then hopefully in some way um, it will help me with the sort of next stage of it, which is say, okay, well, if you're comfortable with that on the field of play and you realize that disabled people are elite athletes operating at the highest level, then why not in the rest of life? hundred percent. I, I want to come back to that, but before I do, I was reminded when you talked about scoring all those goals and all the other people involved in it, um, I've actually got in front of me the letter that Darren Harris, your ex teammate wrote when we, when we made the application for the, for the yeah. honor, he said, Dave was the talent, I was the hard work. He had an eye for goal, excuse the pun, and that's Darren all over that, yeah. which is why his goal-scoring record will never be beaten. Thankfully, I've taken his caps record now. He can't have everything. Yeah, that's absolutely spot on. That's <laughs> absolutely spot on. And, you know, um, I think I mentioned this on the, on the pod last time, but just in case I didn't, me and Darren combined for probably the most important goal in, foot, in, uh, in blind football that's been scored in England. And that was when we were 1-0 down against Italy and we needed a draw to get through to the semi-finals of the European Championships in 2007. And we had to get to the final of that tournament to qualify for Beijing or else it was all over. And 54 seconds to go, I had two marking me on the right-hand wing. I remember it really clearly. I back heeled the ball across the box. And Darren was in there and he controlled it and smashed it into the back of the net. And we drew one all and got through. And then we beat France 2-1 in the semi and got through to the final and qualified for Beijing. And um, that was just that moment where, wow, you know, sliding doors, everything yeah. could have been different. So actually, it was him that scored the most important goal ever, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to use the phrase sliding doors. Yeah, what, 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 what doesn't happen if that goal doesn't get scored? But no, to move it, move... falls over. The whole programme falls over. London 2012 for us probably doesn't happen. So... It's a really, really important moment. And then that brings it back to what you said. So it's what's so important. And there's a lot of conversation, I think, at the moment about um, and a bit of pushback on the idea of Paralympians being 
superheroes in inverted commas. We, uh, we, uh, I know that some para athletes find that almost kind of patronising because actually what's mm. really important is accessibility to everyday, particularly mm. employment. And I know that you're passionate about this, but um, there are a lot of employers out there who are missing out on a lot of talent. Um, and there are also companies out there missing out on customers because they don't provide yeah. good access, accessibility, et cetera. And yeah. I, I'm sure your view is, a view that I share, is that employers, yes, they sometimes need to make some changes and some allowances to bring disabled people into their business, but the benefits for them in doing that mm. are absolutely huge. Yeah, I think, I mean, the problem is, like, uh, you know, most of the people listening to this now won't have any clue how I'm, how I'm talking to you on Zoom, how I'm using my computer, how I handle emails, WhatsApps, create PowerPoints, use Excel, you know, they won't have any idea about that. And yet it happens seamlessly thanks to the software that's been created, um, you know, using speech or using a digital braille display or, or for some, you know, partial sighted people having an enlarged screen. Uh, and so, as you say, it's those minor adjustments, which the government helps with from a funding point of view anyway. Um, and, um, but I think that fundamental not knowing and people putting themselves in that place and going, well, how would I cope? Well, I probably wouldn't. Well, therefore, how can they? You know, and, you know, many a time in my life, I found myself being interviewed on, on two levels. One, can you do the job? And, and two, I can't really believe you can do the job because if I was blind, I couldn't. And it's just a kind of weird... Um, weird way of looking at it and I've lived all my life like this so of course I've adapted of course I'm able to uh, able to deal with this stuff you know so um, I guess yeah it, it is it is really really important to me that you know blind people disabled people are not are not seen as less than you know I think there's an automatic assumption because something isn't isn't working quite as quite right or you know, there's an amputation or, or, or cerebral palsy or, or, or whatever it is, that that person can't possibly be whole and live a whole life. And, um, and it's just nonsense. Everybody's different anyway. You know, everyone, everyone's got a different skill sets and they normally blend into something called a person. And, yeah. um, and, 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 and it just seems to me there's an enormous amount of fear around disability. People go, well, well, how would I cope if that was me? You know, if that happened to me overnight, what would I do? And it's really scary. And you kind of, well, that's not really how it is. And the reality is if it does happen to you overnight, it's something for, for the most part with the right support you can deal with. You can, you, you, you'll be okay with. But I do think it's a fundamental issue, whether it's employment, whether it's whatever, you know, um, I think it's, uh, um, and education is another big one because education obviously leads to employment um, and I think sometimes within the education system uh, and in the employment system there's a lack of aspiration on, on behalf of other people around disability you know that, that yeah, and, and for me that was a driving force throughout from my parents to my school to the people around me you know they set high aspirations uh, and that was really important to me because I could see role models in front of me, you know, people like Mike Brace and Roy Smith from an athletics point of view, or people like uh, uh, Roger Clifton, uh, uh, who was, uh, you know, um, a systems analyst with the Prudential back in the day, and Alistair Fairweather, who was a blind guy I was at school with, who, who was, you know, d designing the wings of, of fighter jets, um, or in one of his jobs, he was re reprogramming the uh, traffic light system uh, for central London. I mean, it would have been hilarious if drivers had been let know that the guy, <laughs> the guy redesigning the uh, traffic light system for central London was a blind guy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But because people just can't, they just can't kind of compute this stuff. And, um, and so I think that's, the, that's, that's where the big gap lies, Matt. It's this big gap of aspiration and big gap of understanding and people going, well, if that were me, and that's not the point. It's not about if that were you, it's about, well, what have I got? How am I dealing with it? It's not about how you would deal with it. Yeah. You mentioned that education. I don't know whether you know this story. I was I was doing some research on blind CEOs, and you are one of the only one. I think you're one only two in the UK, um, and there aren't many in the world. There's an incredible story. I don't know if you know this one, Dave. In, in India, a guy called Shrikanth Bola, um, mm -hmm. who, who was blind, and there were many moves back in the day to say, well, this, you should get rid of this child. We literally remove him from the earth. 
he had to fight for education. Uh, he went to a specialist blind school, but it was unlawful in the region that he lived in for blind kids to have science and maths teaching, which seems really? extraordinary. Um, oh he fought it, in, fought it in a court case, got educated, turns out he's a maths genius, now runs a $48 million um, dollar company, <laughs> which employs oh. lots of disabled people in eco-packaging. Got a called Shrikan wow. Bola. So look, look that one up. Um, that is incredible. If yeah, he I hadn't mean, had the... that education, he doesn't... Achieve what yeah, but this is what happens, you know, um, I mean, the UK has been like this in the past, you know, the level of aspiration for disabled people at times is truly shocking. If you look at the pandemic, you know, some of the stats around likelihood of, of death for disabled people, so even a blind person such as myself was 1.4 times more likely to die. Now that's just, why? Yeah. You know, and the reality is, it's just the, yeah. the, 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 um, the reality is it's just the kind of uh, inequity in life that led to that. Apologies for the puppy, by the way. She's just decided that she's had <laughs> Well, uh, that, that brings us to the, what you said brings me to one thing and then the puppy barking brings me to another. Um, I mean, I think we've spoken before and we had, a, we, we had you on as a, as a brief update. Very sad that we, you, you lost Dennis. Um, and I'd love to tell our listeners that that puppy is in training to be your next guide dog, but no, that's yeah. just you taking on a puppy that just needs love, attention, stroking, yeah. which is what she's getting at the moment. I've been 20 minutes without doing that. So there you go. She's <laughs> getting a bit uppity about it, but uh, so it probably, uh, probably brings things to a na natural conclusion, I would suggest. Well, well quite. They won't hear a word I'm saying after now. <laughs> no, exactly right. Well, no, I, I want to leave with one thing. You mentioned the pandemic. I just want to be absolutely clear, and I know you can't really be too political now that you work for Paralympics GB, but just uh, to be clear, you were not on Boris Johnson's resignation list, and you didn't you didn't <laughs> attend a lockdown-busting party before you got your OBE. <laughs> you, you, you can say that, Matt, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to concur. No, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that that's the direction of travel it came from, though. No, absolutely. <laughs> and... Uh, so you got a letter from the Prime Minister. I presumably, have you got a date for going to Buckingham Palace to meet the King? Not yet, no. No, it's quite funny, actually, because I assumed it would get published at midnight on Friday night, but it got published about half ten on the BBC, and I start, my phone starts exploding. I went to the cricket in Edgbaston at the weekend. Oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, I'm in the hotel room, just, just about to go to bed, and, and my phone starts exploding with loads of messages. So I'm like, oh, it's out there then, is it? And... Uh, and uh, about, about tell me mum <laughs> um, but um so yeah that that bit was just um getting it published i guess uh, down the line it'll be worked out how and where and when um but just a look it's just a massive massive honor i see the honors system actually is a very modern thing in many ways if you look across those people who are who are who are recognized i think there's some incredible incredible people doing some incredible things and um for my part, as I say, it's lovely to be recognised for what I've done in the past, but you know what I can do in the future remains equally important. And also to thank all of those people that um, that enabled me to to get to where I am. And, and Darren's letter is just one of the reasons why I played team sport. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, it's um, it's been an honour to have a small association with Dave, and um, to call you a friend is a, is a is a great thing for me. So, uh, well, likewise. So, um, thank you again. Congratulations, and uh, we'll speak very, very, very soon. Yeah, and let's work our way through the Premier League in terms of because uh, I'm sure I'm sure you'll enjoy every time we go to a club. You'll find some anecdote about how Liverpool lost there or something to, to pick up. So, uh, we've Absolutely. done Chelsea. Let's get let's move on. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely right. As long as you wear your Paralympics tracksuit, I'm sure we'll have find plenty of clubs to take you on. Oh, top man. Cheers, Cheers mate. See you soon. Bye bye. bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Football Journeys. You can follow us on social media on both Twitter and Instagram at Journeys Pod. This is Football Journeys. <laughs>